Less than two months after a gunman slaughtered 19 elementary school kids and two teachers in Uvalde, Texas, and another man massacred 10 black shoppers at a Buffalo, New York supermarket, having targeted people based on the color of their skin, yet another masked gunman shot and killed at least seven people at a 4th of July parade in Highland Park, Illinois yesterday. Police said the shooter targeted spectators with a high-powered rifle from a rooftop. And for hours after, the city was in lockdown as police searched for 22-year-old Robert Cremo, who ultimately led officers on a brief car chase before he was taken in, quote, without incident. As many have noted, his treatment was quite different from that of Jalen Walker, a black man who was shot and killed by police a week before in Akron, Ohio. Body cam footage, which we're only showing part of, shows officers firing at least 60 shots at 25-year-old Walker who was running away from officers after a car chase that started as a traffic stop. Demonstrators have since taken to the streets in Akron and elsewhere to protest Walker's death and racism in policing. Meanwhile, here in Boston, there are a lot of questions about how police did or did not deal with a white supremacist group that marched through the city over the weekend. At one point, images from a Boston Herald photographer appear to show members of the group Patriot Front tackling a black man who said several of them surrounded him with shields and knocked him to the ground. And we later learned that while police say they track the march via surveillance cameras, it's unclear what kind of police presence they had on the ground during the march. But safe to say, it looked very different than what we saw during some of the Boston Black Lives Matter protests back in 2020, a divergence that officials said today they are looking into. I'm joined by one of those officials, U.S. Attorney for Massachusetts, former Suffolk County DA Rachel Rollins. U.S. Attorney, it's good to see you. Thanks for being here. Always a pleasure. Can we start with a little context for a second? For people who feel the presence of white supremacists on our streets is aberrational, it is not. There were the neo-Nazis at the St. Patrick's Day Parade in Southie where they're saying keep uh, Boston Irish. There were the neo-Nazi protesters at Brigham and Women's protesting against doctors campaigning for health care equity, saying they're killing white people. So this, as I say, is not an aberration. That's correct, Jim. We saw, as you said, Brigham and Women back in January of 2022. We saw March 11th, St. Patrick's Day, the incident happening there. And then this weekend, um, we had certain incidents that, of course, were NSC 131, as opposed to the Patriot Front that we saw here. But this is not new to Boston, sadly. What does that say to you? What, what does that say? It, it's troubling that they're becoming more emboldened, um, that these are not small groups of individuals any longer. We had over 100 people marching through the streets. They're also organized, um, quite frankly, and they are not as overt maybe as some other groups that might say, for example, on Facebook, we are, um, there's going to be a thousand of us meeting to march to the state house regarding the following. These individuals aren't engaging in that type of overt behavior right now. Um, and so there are times where they are not known to law enforcement until they actually arrive. And then, Jim, we have to be honest, there is a real tension between certain communities, and this is what we talked about today, the mayor and myself and other law enforcement partners, where there are certain communities that feel like they are surveilled and watched constantly, and then other communities, you know, even though these individuals might not be from here per se, but that have the freedom to show up in March without any sort of questioning or altercation. Well, can I put words in your mouth and tell me if they don't belong there? Certain communities mean, in the first case, communities of color, and in the second, you meant communities or marches that are involving white people. Is that what you were saying? Well, what I, today I can give you a real example. There were individuals that said, you know, there was somebody from the trans community in the meeting that we had with, um, with stakeholders today that said, look, we had a march um, and there were a small number of us and four police cars showed up and put lights on when we had our march for our rights. Um, there was no, you know, th these are their words, not mine. They believe there was no police involvement with respect to this Patriot Front when they were able to march freely down the street and then even engage in an altercation. And to your point, Jim, like setting the table of all of this is sadly the Jalen Walker situation where there's over 90 shots, 
60 enter his body or eg and exit potentially. He traffic violation, he was unarmed and allegedly wearing a ski mask, whereas Robert Crimo, who we know, we know had killed six people and, and harmed at least 30 others, was um, led the police on a, on, a, on a police chase and lived to see another day. No one is in any way implying that we wanted Robert Crimo killed, but there is a real concern in certain communities that we want law enforcement writ large to show the same discretion and de-escalation they show overwhelmingly to certain communities when they engage in murderous acts to others when they have committed no murder themselves. Well, I want to talk about, uh, get back to non-murderous acts for a minute. You seem to be saying, I'm sorry to press this, that uh, 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 c communities of color, communities of vulnerable people, in the case of the trans demonstrators you mentioned a minute ago, are treated differently by law enforcement in this community than white demonstrators like the Patriot Front. That is what you're saying, is it not? Well, what I'm saying is there were people speaking in the meeting that made that very clear that that is what they believe. I need to be explicit about the following. I don't know whether that trans, um, that trans meeting that happened had been put out on social media. I don't, I don't know enough about that incident to speak eloquently about it, but I do know that this organization itself, Patriot Front, um, NSC 131, yeah. they are actively working to be covert so that they will not be infiltrated, they will not be stopped by law enforcement. We saw in Idaho, though, that there were arrests that were made, and some of those individuals are yeah. here in Boston as well. So uh, let's hear from Greg Long, who's the acting superintendent in chief. He was asked today whether they viewed the assault uh, on Charles, I believe is Murrell, is how his last name is pronounced, a black man at the corners of Dartmouth and Stewart. And here's what uh, Long had to say. What I, I will say is, um, my understanding is in Boston, uh, they did not witness it. Um, in terms of the investigation, obviously there's a lot of video um, that's been recovered. Um, and again, I mentioned it inside this meeting. Um, there's a lot of detectives assigned to that um, in an effort to identify those individuals um, involved in this assault. Uh, if we're able to make identifications, you know, um, people's faces are visible. Um, we have mechanisms, you know, to try to identify those people, whether they're out of state uh, or they're local people, um, there will be charges brought. I, I have to say, I don't understand that. Is he saying that the police were not a physical presence and that video surveillance is all there was? W what was he saying, uh, uh, U.S. Attorney? I think, um, Jim, what that was in response to was a question regarding why weren't arrests made right then? If we know that Mr. Morell yeah. was attacked or harmed or, you know, had cuts and bruises to his face or, yeah. or finger or hand, um, why weren't arrests made? And what I think Commissioner Long was saying was none of that happened in the presence of law enforcement. Where were in they? The meeting out Where were they? That's a good question. I don't know whether they that it happened when they weren't physically there yet or not. But what I am doing, Jim, is being briefed by not only the FBI, the transit police, the Boston police and others about what is the video that we can put together to see whether we can do this. You know, we saw Jim in Ohio, uh, Idaho, apologies, that there was riot gear worn, that there was smoke grenades, shin guards and shields. We had shields here. We had face coverings up to, you know, right below our yeah. eyes. We had, um, we had glasses or sunglasses, and there may be some issues with respect to identification, and we have to make sure that we are um, honest about that, but also there are times I'm told that maybe the face mask fell down and we may be able to identify some of those people. Yeah, but, but the issue um, is not, to me, the issue is not Idaho, with all due respect. The issue is you just saw the photograph from the Boston Globe when there were Black Lives Matter demonstrations here. The police were there in great force. Uh, and using some of it, I should say, as compared to, uh, it appears, and maybe I'll be proven wrong, a non-in-person presence here. You said today that you are thinking strategically about how to combat this so people in this community can feel safe. What does that mean, uh, U.S. Attorney? What it means is, and we were asked real pointed questions about this today, does, does Boston, does the Commonwealth have a strategic plan, an affirmative plan regarding um, um, you know, the rise in racially motivated violent extremism, right? And we what's have the heard answer? from the 
What answer did you and get? And the answer is, um, is we, quite frankly, I, I believe there are people that would say we do. We need to be transparent about, is that written down? Have we done trainings with respect to each other? Not just the FBI knowing what their policy is. I don't want a reactive law enforcement, uh, Jim. I want a proactive law enforcement. We are seeing as well, Jim, now certain communities have events coming up in the near future where should the black community now also have the added burden of having to pay for security for their events because they're fearful that individuals mm -hmm. like this may show up if there's a, a com an event in the community, for example, or something else like that. So we need to make sure we are convening. I will be calling uh, together all of our law enforcement partners to see what is the answer to that question. Is there a written document? Okay. And if so, I want to review that. You know, last time when you were here, we had a similar discussion to what you said a few minutes ago about the disparate treatment of whites, for example, in Buffalo after a mass murder as compared to how some people of color who've done virtually nothing wrong are, are, are treated. And you said uh, police often uh, see in, uh, uh, can see uh, themselves in these individuals. Is that what you think happened here in Boston over the weekend with the Patriot Front? I, I don't know. I, I, I don't want to speculate regarding what what happened here, but I will say that there were pointed questions to law enforcement, of which I am a member, mm -hmm. as to the reaction with respect to Black Lives Matter after our entire nation witnessed the execution of George Floyd, mm -hmm. people going out into the streets. And yes, a small fraction of those individuals or faction of those individuals ended up committing um, you know, larcenies or breaking in or harming property. But ultimately, there was a much more concerted police response to those marches than there were to these. There were also, Jim, thousands and thousands more people at the Black Lives Matter event than there were at this. But what we need to do is, is be comfortable enough to go back and look and see are there things we could have done differently? And we is me included, law enforcement, right? Mm -hmm. D was the police response appropriate? And if not, how are we going to make sure the next time that they show up, we are ready for them? And if there's any um, engagement of crimes that they do, whether it's threats mm -hmm. or whether it's trespassing or whether it's any of these other things, I'm not the DA anymore. Remember, those things are mm -hmm. prosecuted now. <laughs> um, you know, I look at it and say, what are we going to do? How are we going to react? And we need to make sure communities feel safe, all communities, because it happened to be a black man or somebody who identifies in the LGBTQ community. But that very well, Jim, could have been a member of the Jewish community, an otherly abled person, a member of the AAPI community. It is, you know, this this ideology is is a belief that only they are apex predators or only they are are in are the victims of the great replacement and the rest of the people that are just here trying to live and be comfortable are somehow a threat to them. And we know that's not true. Rachel Rollins, thanks for your time as always. Appreciate it. You got it.